doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. Voltaire. Are you ready to make the most of the only life you have? To make smart money choices focused on achieving what you care about most? Here to help you balance living well today without sacrificing your tomorrow is the retirement answer man, Roger Whitney. There's a story I tell clients after we've created their roadmap for what type of life they might be able to live, after we've done the negotiation, and after we've sent the action items to start to implement, to start walking that direction. And the story is about possibly having to live in a trailer. So after I've delivered the documents, we've set the action items, and we have assigned action items together, I stop, I take a pause. And I look them in the eyes, alternatingly, and say, now you realize, even if we do everything right, you may still have to live in a trailer. Now realize, there's nothing wrong with living in a trailer. That's not what I'm saying. But generally, these clients live in million-dollar homes or middle-class homes or upper-middle-class homes. So living in a trailer is something that they've never really fathomed or considered. And they look at me and it's like, what are you talking about? Well, why are we doing this then? And what I tell them is, look, we can do everything right, but we could have everything go against us. Healthcare expenses because of your health could skyrocket. Alzheimer's could set in. You could overspend because of rampant inflation. We could get horrible returns. The tax assumptions and the tax rates could go through the roof. If all of these happened all at the same time and in tandem, which is plausible, even if we have a plan that is a high level of certainty, it's not going to work. It's too much of an avalanche of bad coming at us. And ultimately, you may have to live in a trailer. (laughs) Well, you can imagine that they don't feel very comfortable and confident in their plan or in me or in anything at this point. But what then what I tell them is, but here's the thing. If we're super intentional about managing change rather than trying to figure it all out, if we're super intentional about managing change and have the right little conversation so we can make lots of little adjustments along the way, the bright side of this is, If this type of calamity happens, everybody's in the same boat. But if you're attentive and if you're agile, you're going to be making so many little adjustments along the way, you're going to be one of the last people to have to adjust their lifestyle. And you'll be one of the last people moving into a trailer. And it's going to feel like it's not a big deal because we would have been making adjustments along the way. Now, I know that's not comforting in some ways. Because doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty or near certainty or overconfidence that your plan is going to work because you did the work, well, that's absurd. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the webinar, and I'll let you know how you can get access to it if you missed it. And then we're going to talk about some of the feedback, and I'm going to answer some of the feedback from a lot of the great listeners, Don and Howard and Steve and Robert and Barry to answer some of your questions based off of the whole Retirement Plan Live series and the webinar that we had, because you had some great questions. But before we do that, we need to get to that important disclaimer. That's right. It's time for that all-important disclaimer. And it's real simple. I am a fiduciary. I walk life with clients every day, all across the country, helping them plan for and execute a great retirement. But I don't work for you. I don't know anything about you. You don't know much about me, so it would be silly for me to give you advice. So everything on the show is helpful hints and education. Before you make any decisions, make sure you talk to your financial advisor, your legal advisor, or your tax advisor, because that's just common sense. Now let's hop over to the hot topics and talk about how this webinar went. So in the news today, last Wednesday, we had the results webinar, the live webinar, revealing to Joe and Kim 
whether they could retire. And it was a blast. I love doing webinars. I always wonder why I don't do enough. So you may see more of them because I got a lot of great feedback. So last Wednesday was the webinar and we reviewed their plan and their plan did not work as it was outlined. And we looked at some possible solutions to get them most of what they cared about most and ultimately settled on a plan. And you can get access to that on the replay. And I'll tell you how to do that here in a second. But I want to go over the great, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. So here's the great. The great of the webinar and retirement plan live in general is the feedback from you, the listeners, has been amazing. Very positive in you like hearing from other people's experience. You like hearing different experiences so you can relate and understand the contrast of what you're doing. So I love the feedback that affirms that I need to do more of these types of things so you can hear other people's stories. So that's the great. Awesome. Now the good. The good was it started on time. It ran fairly smoothly and it ended as promised and I covered most of everything I wanted to cover. So that's good. Okay. Now the bad. The bad was, <laughs> this is the kind of respect I get. I got kicked out of my own webinar. I think my internet went down in my house and you, it was silent for about a minute or two. But thankfully, I was able to get back on. So we had te some technical difficulties, which is par for the course. So we'll deal with that. Okay. Now here's the ugly. And this is my fault hundreds registered, which is I did not expect in the last webinars that we've done, we all usually have 60 to 70, maybe 90 or so. Well, for this webinar, we had well over 200 people register, but only 100 could get in live. Totally my fault. We use a go-to webinar platform. We have a subscription that we thought was adequate, but it capped it at 100 and it wouldn't let people in. So that totally on me. I want to personally apologize to anyone that tried to log in and was not able to. I am so sorry for that. Obviously, you'll you'll get the replay. You would have gotten it in Six Shot Saturday. If you don't have it, send me an email. And we'll make sure we get it. And please accept my sincere apology for that. So if you weren't able to watch it live because you missed it or you were the victim of my boo-boo, <laughs> I sent out a replay link in Six Shot Saturday this, this last week. I will send it out. I will add that link into the next two Six Shot Saturdays so you can have access to the webinar. And as always, if you have questions or observations, go ahead and email me so I will answer them on future shows. So we're not just going to answer the ones here. I picked out some ones that seem to hit a lot of the broad things. So if you're not signed up for Six Shot Saturday, go to rogerwhitney.com and you can put in your first name and email and you will start receiving it. Now let's get into the practical planning because we got some great feedback and questions from listeners that I really want to dive into. Well, welcome to the practical planning segment where this week we are going to discuss some feedback that you, the listeners, gave, and I'm going to give my perspective on it. And that is partly why I started with the trailer story, because a lot of these had to do with certainty and you know the nuances of things. So I think that was appropriate. So let's just jump in here and get to our first question. And let's go to Don. So Don asks, he says, well, he starts off with the, with the statement, in all of my reading and listening in preparation for retirement, there's obviously a tremendous amount of focus on developing a solid retirement plan. But as I was watching the webinar, I began to wonder if we were to visit Kim and Joe 15 years from now, what would they say about their plan? Do most things turn out as they expected and planned? Were there any big surprises? Did they have to make any major adjustments in their spending or their investment? I realize we can't hop into the future to answer these questions for Kim and Joe, but I was wondering if you have any interesting stories from clients who have been retired for 10 or more years. Don, you've hit the nail on the head when we're talking about a retirement plan. Traditionally, the quote-unquote financial plan or the retirement plan was this enormous binder or the stacks of paper that gave you line item by line item on a cash flow table, what every year of retirement should look like 
given the assumptions of the plan. And it was meant to be a document, sort of like a very formal business plan for anybody that's written one of those or run a business. The problem with that, Don, is exactly what you said. Just like in a business, nothing ever turns out as you plan (laughs) that I'm aware of. My life hasn't turned out as I've planned. I mean, I've had my hand firmly on the rudder of my life, but I have definitely been acted upon by major outside forces that I had no control and no ability to navigate through directly where I wanted to go. And that is why traditional financial planning really falls down. And I think one reason why many of us don't resonate with traditional financial planning, because it it sits there and forecasts so long into the future, in Joe and Kim's case, 42 years, that to answer your question very shortly, yes. The plan, well, if we were to hop 10 to 12 years from now and go look at Kim and Joe, assuming they implemented the the plan that we outlined in the webinar, I can virtually assure you that their life looks nothing like what we planned. It more than likely looks totally different. Now, why is that? Well, one, the things they care about are going to change drastically. Think back to who you were 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. Now, you're still your normal self, but more than likely, the things that you value you focus on and you prioritize are very different than what they were 10 or 15 years ago. So if you're making decisions 15 years back about your life, Don, more than likely those decisions were based on those priorities. And if you didn't have the ability to pivot as your priorities changed and you stayed with a 15-year-old plan, you probably would be very happy. So no, I don't think Kim and Joe's plan would look anything like they're looking. I don't think their goals would be the same. I don't think their spending would be the same. Obviously, the returns and the taxes and the inflation would be much more informed, but I think it would be totally different. And that's okay. It just begs the question, how do you manage that if doing this plan is important? So what I would say, all this focus on developing a solid plan is the first step in being intentional about your retirement. It's only the first step which is scary, but also can be empowering if you target it in the right way. And I'm going to talk about that in the end of the show. So in terms of stories from clients that I could really, obviously, I can't have them on the show and talk about them directly because I have confidentiality for all my clients. Well, let's look at a couple scenarios. Let's assume somebody retired in the mid 80s and they did this solid financial plan with all these forecasts. Well, they had the winds of fate at their back in terms of amazing returns in all the markets, not just the stock market, but the bond market, and more than likely were able to end up with more later in life because they had this tailwind of amazing returns. Now, let's fast forward and say someone that retired in the late 90s. More than likely, their assumptions in terms of returns and things like that were inflated. Now, why do I say that? Because I managed assets in the late 90s, and the return assumptions that people wanted to use were crazy. I mean, I had conversations. Well, I should be able to earn about 20% a year and take 10% a year withdrawal rate, so I should be okay. That is how people are thinking. So obviously, someone that retired in their 90s with this solid plan, like you referred to, if they didn't iterate, and then we went through the technology downturn, and into the 2000s. And if they didn't pivot, or if they weren't agile, their life probably blew up. Fast forward even more, more real for me, especially helping manage people's lives through the 2008 Great Recession, I guess they call it now. The ability to be agile as you went through that and make little incremental changes to mitigate damages of markets. And we've talked about how to do that from time to time was essential to helping clients come out the other end of that without making drastic behavioral decisions or without blowing up their life. Now, did they have to make changes to their life because of 08 in terms of lifestyle? Sure they did. In fact, their willingness to make small incremental changes is a big part of what helps save them 
during that period. So to answer your question, John, yeah, it's going to be totally different. So that begs the question, is it important to develop a solid retirement plan, to use your term, or is it more important to develop and implement a solid, agile retirement process? Now, our next question comes from Howard, and it relates to inflation forecasting. So Howard pointed out, when you do the 1,000 trials and had a projected success rate of 44%, I think it's a little misguided. Because the problem is about what they are doing in terms of a withdrawal rate plus inflation every year after retirement. You assume that the inflation goes up by 4.07% every single year in retirement. Now, I'm paraphrasing because he wrote a long thing. So he's saying, hey, by increasing all of their spending every year by 4.07% and holding that constant is very misguided because people just don't spend that way. So the side effect of having that constant inflation rate applied to all the spending that we're planning for Joe and Kim is that they're not going to have enough money. And that's just really misguided. So that's basically what Howard states and is asking about. And so on the short, Howard, you are correct. People, we don't spend that way. We don't usually spend how inflation is modeled. So we know inflation is there. It's that thief in the night that steals our purchasing power, but it doesn't come in a consistent way, just like returns don't. You know, inflation nowadays is less than 2%, and we're assuming 4.07%. And where we got that inflation assumption is just simply the average CPI since 1970. But inflation has been drastically higher and drastically lower. And we're using a constant rate of inflation. I do not know of any models that account for that variability in inflation in a robust enough way to be used to give advice on, even though it's not a realistic assumption. So I agree with you there, Howard. And secondly, I also agree that it's not a great assumption because we each have our own inflation rate, right? So the wealthier you are, you may have a higher inflation rate because you're buying higher, fancier, good discretionary stuff. It's utilities, it's taxes, it's gasoline, it's all the basic things that we all need. And they're going to have a lot less flexibility in dealing with that. In my practice, walking life with clients, here's how I've I've seen it, Howard, is we use a level spending amount. So we'll say it's $100,000 a year if that's the lifestyle budget. That budget will stay constant for a period of time. And then every so often, we'll have a bump. And usually it's about every five or six years, we'll have a bump up. And then during those five or six years, we'll have some extraordinary things that come up that were unexpected. I don't know how to model that. So yes, this is a little misguided, and it may be a little aggressive in the inflation end of it, but at least that's a conservative assumption. Uh, And that's one of the limitations of any kind of modeling. So hopefully that answers your question, Howard. Now, Steve had a question on the cash portion of the investment management. He said, in the webinar where you showed a breakdown, I believe the cash portion was about 4%. Do you actually manage to a percentage or do you focus on maintaining X number of months of living expenses as you guide for those cash buckets that we're talking about? So Steve, that's a great catch. So I talk about having these two years of lifestyle expenses and then one year of needs and wants as a cash flow management system. And I've done a webinar on that. We've had podcasts on that. And you're asking, you know, if I'm targeting 4% in the portfolio, is that part of that? So the answer is no. And I can't recall what I did for the demonstration purposes for Kim and Joe, but that 4% is separate from the cash bucket. So when I'm developing those cash buckets for clients... I set those amounts separate from their investment accounts. So that is their cash management system. And then what is left over for long-term investment is what would go into the allocations that we model. And it would have its own little bit of cash in there. In addition to, we still do the analysis on the aggregate. So really they're separate, Steve. So hopefully that answered your question. Now, Robert had a question about rollover. He, he said, now, a, a Kim and Joe question. Will Joe move his money out of his 401k to a IRA or brokerage house 
And if so, how will Joe handle the lump sum of money in terms of investing? It's a good question, Robert. Rollovers from 401ks to IRAs are not always the best thing. You know, most advisors will always say, yes, roll it over. And a lot of times it can be in the client's best interest, but and it's not always that way. There are some advantages in some instances to keeping the money in a 401k. In fact, I can tell you from a regulatory standpoint, FINRA and the SEC, the two main regulatory bodies, are looking very closely and are now requiring advisors to document their justification if they recommend to rolling money from a 401k to an IRA, which is a good thing because there has to be a sound basis for that decision. So let's talk about both ends of it. Why would you keep the money in the plan? What are some things that Joe might consider when he's trying to decide, do I keep my monies in my 401k even though I've left the company or do I take it into an IRA? Here are some things to consider. First off, what are the investment options of the plan? If they are very limited, then that might make a case. So maybe I need to roll these over to an IRA, which has many, many more investment options. Really, the world is your oyster for the most part. Uh, So that would be a consideration. What are the investment options? And in the 401k world, it's all over the place. Every plan is different. I've seen amazing 401ks that are have amazing selections, and I've seen the exact opposite. So that's going to be the first consideration. The second consideration, and this is in no particular order, is fees. Even if there are great investment options, are the fees reasonable enough relative to moving it to an IRA and doing it myself? Again, this is all over the place. I've seen very low, well-run plans, and I've seen super expensive, not very well-run plans. But that is a consideration. What are the fees that you're paying? The third consideration is, one advantage that some 401ks have, and not all of them, and I t- in all the planning I do, I always check this out, is 401ks have the option of having what's called a stable value fund. Now, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of what a stable value fund does, but in general, it acts like a money market or savings account. Over the last, I think it's 15 years, over the stable value fund association, which I guess is an association, those have averaged around 2.6%. Even today, I see those options where they're paying 2%, which is not something you'll get in a for IRA in terms of a money market or cash-like instrument. So that could be a big advantage, especially when you're trying to allocate fixed income in such a low interest rate environment. Another option is that federal law helps protect 401ks against lawsuits. So in terms of asset protection, it's federal law that mandates 401ks where if you or whereas an IRA, if you have an IRA, those rules are governed by state law. So it's a state by state case in terms of how well your retirement accounts are protected for asset protection purposes. Another consideration is If you leave or separate service from your employer after age 55, you may be able to tap into your 401k without penalty, without having to do a substantial equal payments or any of those other other strategies. 401ks, if you separate service age 55 or older, you may be able to tap that from time to time without any penalty so that you won't be able to do that with an IRA. So that might be a consideration. Another consideration is, If you make too much money to be able to make Roth IRA contributions, if you're above the income limits for Roth IRA contributions, there's what's called a backdoor Roth, where you make a contribution to a IRA as a non-deductible contribution, and then you immediately roll or convert that money into a Roth IRA, which gets around those income limitations because you're still allowed to do that and there are no income limitations on that. Now, if you have a lot of money in an IRA, it gets a little bit more difficult to do that because of how they look at pre-tax, post-post-tax money. So leaving all of your retirement assets in a 401k can help you do that. I've actually, I have some clients right now, we're executing that right now and 
we purposely have left money in 401k so we can still have this option. So that's a way of thinking about that. So there's not a really clear answer, Robert. It just has to be what's in your best interest when you look at all these different factors. We're getting so many great questions. I'm just going to keep chugging along here because I think these are really important questions when we're thinking about planning our future. So the next one comes from Don on how to plan for change in the future. So I'm just going to read Don's comment without commentary. He says, Roger, I appreciate your presentation reviewing the savings and spending analysis with inflation and the simulations that determine confidence level percentage. This discussion was enlightening, but my concerns include current factors such as world economy, including excess capacity, record number of displaced people, world development versus 30 years ago that are not included in the simulation. Rather than look forward, It appears all financial advisors, Wall Street, and softwares want to base the future on the past. And with the speed of technology, no one is considering the development of robots to replace many of us, the speed of communications to make quicker decisions, even though they may not be accurate. Are there softwares available that include forward-looking factors that are available to you? Don, a great question. We feel like we are in a period of unprecedented innovation and change. How do you plan your future for that? So in the return risk and correlation data that I use for the models, it went back to 1970, and I talked about why I only went back to 1970. But I want to talk about that a little bit. What has happened since 1970? We've had globalization as a percentage of global GDP from 1965 to 74. It was about 20% of global GDP, meaning business done on a global level. In the last nine-year period, it's around 70%. We've had oil embargoes. We've had impeachment in the White House. We've had wars on multiple continents. We've had the fall of the USSR. We've had the rise of internet jobs. We had manufacturing jobs go down by 37% from their peak in 1979. We've had the whole landscape of the industrial economy change to this digital economy. So let's just, let's just look at that one real quick. Let's look at 2009 and the big three automakers. Combined, they had $250 billion in revenue. They had $36 billion of market cap, which is the value of all their stock added up based on the price in 2009. So combined, all three big automakers were worth $36 billion. And they employed 1.2 million people. So let's look at the top three digital companies today. In two, Well, 2014. We'll look at 2014. That's where I have the data. And this is from Business Insider. Their revenue... The top three digital companies, $250 billion compared to $250 billion for the big three automakers. Their market capitalization, meaning the total value of all of their stock for the three companies, whereas the automakers combined were worth $36 billion, these three digital companies were worth a trillion dollars. And then listen to this one. Whereas the top three automakers employed 1.2 million employees, the top three digital companies have employed 137,000 employees. There's been some major change. There's been displacement of workers. There's been innovation that we cannot imagine. Things that we never would have thought of. Cell phones, the internet, computers, all happened in the last 47 years. Does that mean that the future will be different? Of course it will. But what do we have to work off of? Because the key in forecasting the future, in my opinion, is you have to forecast it with enough confidence that you provide actionable intelligence to plan your life. And we're looking at a 40 plus year time horizon, say for Joe and Kim, we're talking about a 40 year time horizon. So are we going to try to forecast the future with enough confidence, not just forecast the future, but with enough confidence that we actually act upon it to make plans for our lives over 40 years. I don't think there's much utility in that exercise. Now, I agree using historical data has its limits, but it does include periods of major disruptions in jobs, major disruptions in the world economy, 
more than I think sometimes we appreciate. So my conclusion has been, as a fiduciary and an advisor, is I have to use historical data, the best data I can find, to inform my decision-making, not to dictate it, but to inform the decision-making and then be hyper-vigilant, be very agile in making little adjustments as reality unfolds so we can mitigate the risks and possibly take advantage of some of the opportunities from all the things that we can't even imagine right now. See, I would disagree. I think most of Wall Street looks at And the media looks at trying to predict the future with forecasts and strategists and return expectations. And I can actually run return expectations rather than historical returns. I just choose not to because that's introducing an unknowable into the equation based on someone's guess about the future. doesn't matter how smart they are. So, Don, I don't know how you would, even if you could forecast the future and had enough of resources, and there are plenty of think tanks out there doing it, It has to get to the level of actionable intelligence that you can feel confident in. Otherwise, there's no utility in the exercise. So that's how I look at it. Okay, so we have two more questions, and these relate to that confidence number. So first goes to Barry. Barry wants to know, well, is 86% confidence good enough? Wouldn't 100 be better? So let me read Barry's comments. He says, thank you for doing the webinar. My question for you is how come you seem so excited about a success rate in the 80s? He said low 80s. I think it's 86. You acted like they had it made. No worries. I wouldn't feel that way. I would be nervous that there were too big of a chance of running out of money. Before I take the big leap into the unknown, I would like to see a success rate at least at the 90s, if not approaching 100. Is this unreasonable? Am I looking at things wrong? Okay, so why was I so excited? Well, part of that, Barry, was I'm doing a webinar. I'm basically talking by myself, and I just got to keep the energy up. (laughs) And I'm excited just to be with everybody, right? So there might have been some in that. But you are correct. At the 86% confidence level, the whole thing could blow up. But you know what? At the 90% confidence ratio, it could all blow up. At the 100% confidence ratio... It could all blow up. Everybody could live in a trailer if the right circumstances happen in their life. So what I get to is what we're all trying to do today is all of us are sitting here and we we want to live the best life we can right now because this is the only life we have, truly, right? And we want to make sure we take care of the future. And when we're entering retirement, that's really scary. We feel like we want to have more confidence. We want what? We want certainty or as near certainty as we can get. Unfortunately, certainty is absurd. So if we take Kim and Joe as an example, could we have gotten them to 90% confidence or even 100% confidence? Sure, we could have. So what are some of the levers we could have pulled during that demonstration to get them to the higher levels of confidence. Well, we could have taken more investment risks, so that would give us the possibility of more returns, maybe, you know, maybe not. We looked at some of that. We could increase their savings. We could make Joe work longer. We could have him work longer in retirement, even after he retired. We could say, sorry, you can't live to 100, Kim. You're going to have to die earlier. We could have reduced their lifestyle, or their spending goals in retirement, any one of those levers that we play with in that fashion and run the analysis would increase their confidence level. But it's a balancing act, Barry. You know, if you think of the rest of your life on one side of the teeter-totter and living a good life today, you got to balance that. Because if we had made all those those adjustments to get them up to a 95 or 100% confidence level. One, it's a false idol. It's not 100% or 95% confidence level. It's just the analysis at this day and time. And two, if we had made the adjustments, their teeter-totter or their seesaw would have been tilted way far to the future and the price would have been in their life right now or in the life in retirement and a diminished ability to live the life that they wanted. 
So there's a balance between those two things. When I look at this process, what I try to do is help them understand the trade-offs and let them lead the discussion to the things that they value most. There are some people that value living well today and are willing to sacrifice later on, but it's trying to find that balance. My role is to help inform that decision-making, give them the wisdom of my opinion, but not drive it for them. So hopefully that helps, Barry. I think next week when we talk about agile retirement management, my ARM process, it's going to even make more sense. So the last comment slash question is from Annie about the confidence level again. And she says, I still wonder if 86% chance of the money lasting is a high enough percentage. However, the numbers were very encouraging about what's possible. My husband and I are five years older than Kim and Joe. So we've already worked those extra years and it truly paid off for us. Our net worth is bumping $4 million. What a blessing, even though we're still not sure it's enough. And then she goes on to thank me. And that sort of goes to the last point. Whether it's half a million dollars, $2 million, $4 million, $10 million, $50 million. I can tell you from walking life with people on all of these different levels. You never have certainty. You never feel like it's enough. And that fear, especially when it's fed by marketing messages in the media, can truly steal your life away from you. So next week, what we're going to do is I'm going to try to give you a framework. I talk about it all over the place, but I'm going to give you a framework about the agile retirement management process, my ARM process for how you deal with a lot of the issues that we brought up today. But I don't want to ramble on too much. So let's get on to the happy lab. Hey, welcome to the happy lab. So last night I was at a gas station. I was filling my car up and this guy pokes his head around and he says, Hey Roger, how you doing? And it's a buddy of mine from CrossFit while I was still doing CrossFit. I hadn't seen him in like six months. His wife and he went to CrossFit and they have a beautiful, you know, two or three year old boy. And he sticks his head around him. Hey, how you doing? We shake hands and everything else. And he goes, you heard so-and-so his wife moved out. It's like, no, I didn't hear that. They always seem totally happy and in love because I was around him a lot. I'm like, well, they seemed like they were totally in love. And yeah, she moved out and she moved over to the city and he's got the son who's three or so. And my heart was broken obviously for the child, but for him and for her. And I don't know the circumstances of what went on. But what I thought about later, whether it comes to marriage, your health, your money, your retirement, we tend to think things are okay and great. And we talk about them as they're great until they're not. And I think the reason for that is We don't have intentionality on checking in on things in a deeper than surface level. Someone comes up to me, hey, hey, Roger, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How you doing? No, Roger, how are you really doing? We don't do that second question, that earnest question, whether it's with ourselves on our health or issues we're dealing with in our work or in our marriage. We don't go to the second question. So what ends up happening is everything appears great until it's not. That's why we need to be agile. That's why we need to be intentional to make sure those little conversations are happening. So do me a favor, go have a little conversation with someone you think you should. You'll be happier. On your marks, get set. Hey, welcome to the Smart Sprint segment. Well, off of that somber, but happy lab segment in the next seven days, Go have a earnest conversation with the person you love. Next seven days, go do it. Take them out. Everybody put their phones away. Sit table to table. Don't have an agenda. Just get a feel and listen to how they're doing and get connected. Hey, I want to thank you so much for staying on this extended edition. I was so excited about Retirement Plan Live. 
I'm Roger Whitney. I work with clients across the country walking this journey to retirement. If you are looking for an advisor to help you on this journey and walk with you over time, go to rogerwhitney.com and click on work with Roger and we can set up a time to talk. So excited having you here. Until next week, this is Roger Whitney, the Retirement Answer Man. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.